You ever wonder why your waypoints sometimes look synced and other times they're messed up? Or where those TRGs and circles in your Abras come from? What about the perform nav pause fix or the nav area messages? This guide is useful for the mission designers wanting to understand the tools they bring to the K-50 pilot and for those pilots to quickly assess what they've been given and what that data means. You'll see what's happened with your friendly ground crew and that briefing and pre-flight setup that DCS lets you skip. Number points placed in the mission editor are always in sequence. You can't choose to skip numbers. Waypoints placed for a formation have been captured on your Abris and P-800 memory. However, depending on how the waypoints have been placed, there can be subtle differences between the PVI and Abris. If the aircraft start icon was placed anywhere, even in an airfield, and set to flyover point, turning point, take off from ground or take off from ground hot, then both your PVI and Abris will have the first waypoint set to your starting location. From there, the numbers will be synchronized between the PVI and Abris. The PVI can store up to six waypoints, while I've seen the Abris handle over 115. If the aircraft icon was placed on an airport or heliport FOP, even the invisible ones, and set to take off from ramp, runway, or parking hot, in other words, snap to a runway or FOP, then your PV800 will have the first airfield button show the coordinates of that airfield. The first waypoint will be the first point away from your starting location from the mission editor. However, the Abris flight plan, the first waypoint will be the center of the runway or heliport, but not necessarily your pad, and then count up from there. So the Abris waypoint numbers will always be one number higher than the PV800 for that same waypoint. If the final waypoint was placed on an airfield or FOP and set specifically to landing, then it'll appear as a PV800 airfield instead of a waypoint. If you started snap to an airfield, and airfield button 1 shows your starting location, then it'll be assigned to the button 2. Otherwise, the final destination will be stored as airfield 1, so the first available airfield slot really out of the two possible ones. Note, it doesn't matter how many waypoints have been placed, so you can exceed the PV800's limit of 6. As long as the ending one was placed on an airfield and set to landing, it will be recorded as an airfield on the PVI. If you placed any waypoints after the final airfield, then the mission editor waypoint changes it to landing refuel arm and it won't be added as an airfield. Only a waypoint if you still got the space. This final airfield can be the same one you started from. If you're using route mode in flight, then your K-51 automatically switch between flying the waypoints when it reaches the final waypoint and switching to the final airfield. You'll have to switch it manually, but then again at that point you might just want to pilot manually to land. Note Ebris's flight plan will show the starting and final airfields only as waypoints. There's no special distinction like there is with the PVI. As a mission designer, you might want to make use of these snapping to airfield functions if the airfield isn't too congested already and you need to find space to place all the airframes. Useful where you really need to pack in all the waypoints you have so you can get those six waypoints plus two airfields on your PVI. As a pilot, if you jump to someone else's mission, there's a few ways to check how it's been set up. Once you enter the Abris map view, if it shows the next waypoint is 2, then you know the starting waypoint is your airfield, and the airfield 1 button on the PV800 will be your home plate. Your Abris waypoint number will always be one higher than the PVI for the same waypoint. And the Abris flight plan, the very topmost entry, will look mostly blank. If the Abris next waypoint number is 1, then even if it looks like you start an airfield, you won't snap to it, and your PVI 800's first way of, uh, airfield won't be your starting location. Another check you can do is pressing the airfield and 2, and if it shows coordinates, you know both your start and end are airfields, and the PV800 waypoint numbers you're heading towards are always one less than the Abris for those same coordinates. If neither airfields 1 or 2 show coordinates, the waypoints are perfectly aligned between PVI and Abris. If there's one airfield, you need to suss out if it's the final one or your starting one. By selecting the airfield, you can check its distance on your horizontal situation indicator, or HSI, or this button. If it shows a distance over maybe 2Ks, then it's a landing destination airfield. If it shows under 2Ks, then it could be either your takeoff 
or your landing airfield. They might be the same thing. A third check is seeing if your first PVI waypoint distance is close to zero, which means you've started in the wild, so to speak, and your waypoint numbers will be synced with your ABRIS, except maybe for your final destination airfield. You only have one flight plan at spawn. If you needed alternate flight plans, you'll have to manually unload and create a new ABRIS flight plan and synchronize that with a PV800 if you wish. The mission editor can create as many target points as you want, but only the first 10 are captured in the PV800, from 1 to 9 and then 0 being number 10. All target points from the mission editor will be created as ABRIS reference points as well, showing a little X in the middle along with the text TRG and the number. I highly recommend adding these in the mission editor for missions designed for low visibility at night, for example, as it shaves down time slewing manually with a hat and looking for targets when you don't have the helmet sight. You cannot add detailing targets from the mission editor, only target points. Only the first four INU fixed points appear in the PVI, regardless of how many are captured in the mission editor. On the Abris, they're captured as blue INT dots, so they look similar to waypoints but without the connecting blue lines, and it's got the text IFX and its number next to it. I don't believe you can recreate these mid-mission on the Abris. These points are intended to be placed on visually identifiable landmarks, so you can use the INU fixed taking methods to fly over or schwalock these landmarks and recalibrate your initial navigation units in longer flights. However, since at the moment I knew drift is as far as I not implemented on DCS in the shark, all these points do is annoy you with an Akron perform nav pause fix messages when you get near it in flight. Anything added as initial point objects in the machine editor, typically for names on the map and specific special locations, is captured only the Abris as reference points with an X and text beside it. The first five characters are the call sign, and a lot of the comments are shown in the Abris map, potentially spilling over a large area of your map. If you info on it, it'll reveal the longer call sign, and as much of the comments can fit in a line on the Abris. They're typically used for denoting special nicknames for lo or code names for locations. As they're reference points, they look the same on the Abris as preloaded target points, so I wouldn't name any of them T or G. The bull's location is not reflected anywhere in the shark. The mission editor would need to place a special initial point object or some other proxy on the bull's location and label it appropriately, otherwise the sharks won't know where it is without manually looking up the coordinates or using the F10 map. Non-hidden SAM and AAA threats from the mission at time of your spawn are shown as blue circles on your Abris. The color of your faction on the Abris is always red and enemies are always blue, including their masked threat zones. It is not related to your faction color you chose from the roll menu. Tactical threats on your Abris is getting its own video once I complete those tests. Just like airports, which automatically come from the map, placed heliports, like FARPs, will be displayed on your Abris. Note the Abris won't know if that FARP is actually active and functional, so if the mission designer didn't get a fuel truck or munitions close enough to the FARP, you won't be getting service there. Now for the other stuff, most a little more intuitive in general. Elements from the map, like magnetic variants and the towns or airports, are uploaded to your Abris automatically, you don't need to do anything in the mission editor. Note that at this time, the Syria map, if you were to go into Abris and search for towns, you will not see them listed. You'll see airports and stuff like that, but not towns. Weather and the time of your spawn is uploaded to your PV100 and Abris as static values. Preloaded, so your shark won't know about changing weather and temps. The time making this video, the Abris flight plan is bugged, so your temps and wind speeds there look a bit um, Mars-like, shall I say. Check out more of this in my video about wind and spinning. Now, I haven't tested extensively on every map and season, but it appears that if you set to spawn between 10 p.m. and up to just before 6 a.m., then you'd automatically be equipped with night vision goggles instead of the helmet sight, regardless of how light it is at that time and that season. As a mission designer, you'd need to play test it and see which times work for you if you're you know, setting up a mission where everyone starts at the same time.
Not with the fake contrast lock that we have in DCS at the moment. The range your schwal will lock will drastically reduce long before it looks dark. So don't fixate on this 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. times in terms of your schwal tracking distance purposes. That's a separate thing. If after 10 seconds of your ABRIS booting to the settings page, the nav error at the top hasn't switched to a green 3D and the GNSS page is showing no satellites connected, then the mission editor wasn't set up to allow you satellite access. Now, I've tried killing the INU, KO for one, day links, radio switches, generators. None of those seem to affect the satellite link, you know, if you're worried you botched the startup procedure. I believe it's to do with the factions. I don't know if ED is trying to tell us something, but from what I can tell, you only have satellite connection if you specifically have Russia and or USA on your side in the mission editor factions. Soviet Union aggressors, any other faction, do not count. If neither US nor Russia have been added to the color side your helo is assigned to, you won't be getting GPS. As long as any one of those two is on your side, your helo can be assigned to any country and you'll get GPS. Maybe someone can pitch in the comments, but I'm not sure this never actually affects your ABRIS in the sim in any way, other than you know, looking annoying. Now selecting the helo icon itself, you can of course change a bunch of obvious things like your call sign, side number, most of these are intuitive. Some things to note is the R800 VHF2 starting radio frequency, which is shared by others in your immediate formation. This R800 value also determines radio frequency used by the AI black shocks, which they don't tend to change. So you need to go to that frequency to share dialing targets with them. Many loadouts start with a full load of fuel, rockets, and Vickers, which is technically beyond the vertical takeoff limit for the shark. I mean, the shark can do it. You know, there's a video footage of it doing it, but it's beyond what it should be doing, and it's recommended that at that load you do runway takeoffs, you know, not just a FARP putting the guts out and going straight up. I anyway recommend lightening the load, as the starting load is actually quite sluggish. I mean, you're really overburdening it, even with those powerful engines. So if you're only dealing with high-threat armor targets, remove the rockets. They're going to bring you too close to the threat and not be that effective against the armor. And otherwise, you know, consider reducing the fuel at least. You typically don't need the full tank. Your starting loadout automatically sets your weapon selector knobs to the correct rocket or bomb setting to get the right estimated impact point. If you change it or when you spawn in, you'll have to change the knob yourself. Only player or client set black sharks get options for fixed points, target points, failures, R828 radio, and ARC-22 options. The R828 VHF-1 radio and ARC-22 can only use the predefined 10 radio channels and 8 automatic direction finder ARC-22 channels respectively. Since there's no display in the cockpit which frequency each channel corresponds to, I recommend placing these on the kneeboard. The vanilla kneeboard at the moment is not useful. Since the data link works off the R800 radio, the R828 is typically the one you might use for communicating to other flights and controllers. So set up the frequencies accordingly to correspond within the ranges of the R828. Note the list of failures you can simulate is not nearly the full list of what can actually be damaged on the KF-50 damage model. Actual battle damage can ruin a whole host of subsystems, even individual lights. Once your flight plan begins, your PV-800 and Abris will no longer automatically double capture things. What you do in one system, the other system won't know about. Stuff from the mission editor is always consecutive numbers, but in mission, you can skip numbers in the PV-800 if you want. Your PV-800 won't know about anything you add on your ABRIS, including data link targets. Your ABRIS won't know about any waypoints, airfields, or INU fixed points you update, create, or select on the PV-800 in the mission. Target points you create or update will show as a flashing box in ABRIS while you have it selected on the PV-800 in operational mode. This is the only connection your ABRIS and PV-800 really have. Target points that came from the mission editor, of course, have a duplicate reference point on them with a little X and the TRG text. But ones you create in mission won't have that and will be invisible until you select it. And then you'll only see the flashing box around the outside of the target point. Of course, these reference points also remain in the ABRIS. So if you redefine your target points in the PV-800, those reference points are still sticking around unless you manually were to go in and delete them. 
I hope this video has demystified some of the background workings, so next time you hop behind the stick, you can with confidence say, yep, I know what's going on, how it's set up, how to fix it. My captain's an idiot, and I hate my ground crew. This is Volk. Next guide, I'll resume the Datalink and Target series, with a general tips video showing more on the Datalink connection itself, finding things in the Abris, and tying together the individual elements I've covered earlier. Cheers.